I work for the National Park Service in Glacier Mountain Park in Montana as a park ranger. If you're in love with the outdoors like me, then there really isn't any better occupation in the world. Spending my life in this beautiful reserve and getting paid to do it, well, it's like a dream come true. It's not all campfire songs and scenic walks, though. This job can be dangerous at times. I found myself in scary situations more than a few times. But nothing ever came close to this incident. We received reports of a missing hiker. The story we got was that his wife and kids were tired and wanted to go back to the cabin they rented for a short rest. Apparently, he considered it a waste of daylight and had gone off on his own for a short hike, promising to meet his family at the cabin later. The sun had set, and he never returned. There was little that could be done in the dark, so plans had to be made to form a grid-style search the following morning. It was warm enough, and unless he had encountered a bear or some other predator, he'd be fine. Drawing the short straw, I was given a stretch of the park that was rarely traveled. There was no grand vistas or scenic overlooks, but my superiors thought it a possibility that the man may have ended up there. Normally, I would have a partner, but several of the other park rangers were tending to a series of grizzly attacks on the other side of the park. So I saddled up and hit the trail solo. The first few hours were predictably uneventful. I took it as an opportunity to enjoy the solitude of the park and get away from the tourists for a little bit. Around noon, I came across what might have been the first sign of our missing hiker. A ripped sleeve of a sweatshirt was hanging from a low branch. It matched the description of the man's clothing. I believe there was a good chance that he might be somewhere in the area, so I continued the hunt. Following the likely path the man would have taken, I stumbled across a much more sinister symbol of his passing. In the middle of the pathway, was a pool of dried blood and what looked like a small slab of human skin. I carry a service pistol as well as a can of bear spray, and this was almost definitely the work of a grizzly bear. They're common enough in the park, and the other attacks the rangers were dealing with gave weight to my theory. There was a faint blood trail leading away from the scene. I had done a fair bit of hunting, so pistol in hand, I began following the trail. After about 20 yards or so, I came across another piece of torn clothing, also covered in blood. I was definitely nervous at this point. Despite their massive size, grizzly bears are capable of moving quickly and silently, and I was on edge. I found several more signs, blood splatter and ripped cloth. Eventually, I stumbled onto a scene that made me sick to my stomach. I walked into a scene of complete carnage. Bits of a human body were spread all over the place. Blood spatters covered the trunks of all the nearby trees and bushes. Looking at this site of complete slaughter, I knew instantly there was no way this was the work of a grizzly bear or any other animal known in the park. My gun hand was shaking so badly that I was afraid I was accidentally going to pull the trigger. I crept toward the biggest portion of the body to inspect it. It was only a torso with an arm attached. There were no bite marks of any kind that I could see. It seemed as if something had used brute force to rip the body apart. I decided that it was high time for me to get out of there and return to the ranger station to report my findings. I could rally a few rangers to come up here and collect the remains of the poor guy. Then I heard it. A deep bellow as if it was coming from a large man echoed from the woods just north of me. Then I heard something crashing through the brush right in my direction. I didn't waste time to see what it was and just turned on my heels and took off. I was running back the way I came and could hear the monstrosity crashing through the undergrowth behind me. It was gaining on me. I ran as hard as I could, but this area was mountainous and I had to constantly jump over downed trees and skirt around boulders. I was tiring quickly and the creature was almost on top of me. I made a decision. 
After passing through another small clearing, I came to a stop just beyond its edge. I wheeled around and lifted my gun, pointing it right at the spot I could hear the creature heading to. It rushed into the clearing at a dead run. Towering over my six feet, the creature was covered head to toe in matted and filthy gray hair. I didn't wait to get a better look. I fired six shots right at the thing. I must have hit it a few times, bellowed in pain. As I turned to run, something soared right past my head, slamming into a tree trunk just a few feet away. With my last reserve of energy, I sprinted through the forest, all the time waiting for a hand to grab me from behind. It never did. Even after a moment of quiet listening, I couldn't hear the beast anymore. I eventually made it back to the ranger station in a complete state of dishevelment. I told my superior what had happened. After giving my statement and getting treated for the minor cuts and scrape I received on my flight through the forest, I was driven home and told to rest for a day or two before coming back to work. Eventually I received a call from my boss and asked to come to the station. A group of rangers had gone back to the spot where I encountered the creature and recovered the remains of the man. I was told that I'd come into contact with the same grizzly bear that had been terrorizing other parts of the park. When I insisted it wasn't a bear, my boss told me that maybe I should take an extended leave of absence for mental health reasons. I dropped it. From what I understand, the man's family was given the same story of being attacked and killed by a bear. I know that this wasn't a grizzly bear. Bears don't run on two legs. They don't make noises like I heard. And they sure as hell don't throw things. I had just started work as a police officer. I was new. A lot of the other officers didn't have a lot of faith in me. So when I think back on this event, I sometimes wonder if I was in over my head. I never really told the truth about what had happened, neither did my partner at the time. We didn't think we'd be believed. I hadn't earned a good reputation yet, and only my partner had me as a witness to what had happened. Do you think anyone would believe us? Absolutely not. If anything, my being there would have just made everyone more skeptical about our encounter. I wouldn't say that we covered it up. I would say that we didn't report what had happened, because we didn't fully believe what we'd seen either. What would you do in a situation like that? Probably the same as we did. I'm a little nervous to explain how things transpired. It's been so long and I've never uttered a word about it since that night. It was Halloween. I was on duty. Most officers hated Halloween night because of all the mischief and drinking. Plus, the department saw Halloween night as a reason for people to create things in their mind. To let imaginations run amok. So, of course, they sent the lower-ranking officers. My partner had been in the department for a long time. He didn't really advance much. From what I was told, he had some problems with drinking in the past. But from what I saw, he was very committed to the job, but also very worried about ruining his reputation further. That night, we'd been called out for several things. Rowdy teens lighting trash cans on fire, bar fights, you know, stuff like that. Eventually, there was a call for loitering. Apparently, several people had called and stated there was a strange man in a light-colored costume walking around one of the city's bridges. Many of the calls reported that the character hadn't done anything, but that it was very close to a residential area with kids, and the person seemed to be a bit menacing. So, of course, the entire nation was worried about child predators at the time, so I could understand the alarming nature of this. We were driving to the location. The area was pretty dark, lots of trees, and even though it was near a residential neighborhood, it looked very unkept and far from any houses. Really, it reminded of this wooded area from my hometown where kids would sneak off to to party. So I had it in my mind that we were looking for a drunk kid in a costume. That seemed plausible. Or even a homeless man wandering around. Nothing seemed too unusual about it. Eventually, we get to an area with a concrete tunnel. I suppose bridge would be the correct term for it, as it was apparent that the tunnel acted more as an archway. 
At the top of this arched bridge was a looming figure in a light-colored outfit of some sort. I couldn't see his face because we were still quite a distance away, but I could tell that it was most likely a man. He appeared to be wearing some type of jumpsuit that was very pale in color and something on his head. Now it could have been a hat, a mask, a hood, really I'm not sure what it was. We didn't want the individual to make a run for it, so we parked where we were, climbed out of the vehicle and headed towards the bridge. The air was very cold and it felt very dense and heavy. I wouldn't have admitted it then, but the hair on my neck stood up straight and I just felt tension. As we got closer to the bridge, the individual looked more like a silhouette. We no longer had the benefit of our headlights to light up the bridge, so I tried my flashlight. It didn't work. My partner tried his. Same situation. My partner calls out to the guy. Hello, sir. How's your night going? We were really thinking that the man would be intoxicated, so we were expecting some slurred response. But nothing. We were nearly at the base of the tunnel, so my partner was puzzled that the individual wasn't responsive. This can be alarming because we aren't sure what state the individual's in. Did he need help? Could he not speak? We aren't sure about any of his circumstances, so we had to be prepared for anything. Sir, what are you doing out here? This is a residential area. Do you live here? I looked up at the shadow. I still couldn't tell what the man was wearing, but it did seem like it was weathered and dingy. Sir, if you aren't going to respond to our questions, we'll have to come up there with you. Still no response. My partner looked at me and I looked at him. He nodded, meaning that we needed to approach the man closer. So my partner goes to the left of the bridge and I go to the right. We climb up a hill on both sides to get to the top of the bridge. The hill was a bit damp. The night had been humid and foggy, so it was a bit slick. By the time we reached the top, my partner and I were looking at each other from across the bridge. The man was no longer there. He basically vanished. We approached the area where the man was. We started looking for traces of anything that would tell us he was there. But there was nothing. Puzzled, we started to look around the wooded area and in the tunnel. The perpetrator was never found. It's been known since the mid-2000s that every human being with blue eyes shares the same common ancestor. Did you know that? The research began in 1996. There's a specific genetic mutation affecting the OCA2 gene that created a switch in blue-eyed individuals. Switch is the word used by Hans Eiberg, the geneticist responsible for that study. That switch dilutes the melanin present in these individuals' eyes and turns them from brown to blue. It's all very basic and very trivial on the surface. It's an evolutionary trait with no impact whatsoever on the survival of the species. That is, of course, according to that first study. I was involved in a different study. I was one of three Americans partnering with a genetics team in the Netherlands. Our job was to narrow down the possible identity of the original blue-eyed human being. We were hoping to deduce which hemisphere the subject was most likely from and approximately which years they would have lived in, how many blue-eyed offspring they could have produced given their theorized point of origin and the resources available at the time. We learned a lot more than that. We learned things that I wish we didn't. Some knowledge, unfortunately, just can't be put back. The early days of our research mostly involved processing the data already gathered by our counterparts in the Netherlands. We eventually began receiving samples of the genetic material that they were studying. To my knowledge, they had acquired DNA samples of several historical body, the kind dating back thousands of years. They were primarily focusing on material recovered from Europe and Africa. According to their research, they were the two possible points of origin that made the most sense. We believed their data. We had no reason to question the results that we'd been fed, and when the genetic material started to arrive, we were eager to begin our own testing. 
We must have examined DNA from more than two dozen bodies. Time and time again, we failed to discover the mutation present in modern blue-eyed human beings. We became frustrated. We were convinced that the Netherlands had taken a misstep at some point. We re-examined the data and we double-checked the results from the samples that we'd been provided. We discovered something problematic. We were so focused on the composition of the OCA2 gene that we weren't analyzing the DNA as a whole. Some of the specimens weren't human at all. We couldn't identify them. When we contacted our partners overseas and inquired about these samples, they intentionally kept us in the dark. In hindsight, it's likely that they just knew as little as we did. They were trying to protect themselves. We continued with the study. Honestly, we were fascinated. We hadn't yet identified our mystery samples, and we also hadn't answered any of the questions about the blue-eyed ancestor. There was plenty for us to obsess over professionally. The bizarre nature of the work and the risks we might have been taking were both secondary concerns. We wanted to know. Finally, there was a match. The results were confirmed by both the American and Dutch labs. The genetic material was roughly 6,000 years old. We were closing in on an ancestor. However, this DNA wasn't entirely human either. Once our search became focused on this particular sample, it was easier for us to solve the identity of the mystery species. We eliminated every animal native to Earth, one at a time. We submitted our findings on the blue-eyed ancestor around the same time that we all came to the same conclusion. The originator of the mutation couldn't have been human at all. That's why we were testing genetic material from specimens that only shared qualities with the human genome. We had only one theory. The ancestor we were looking for was extraterrestrial. The lab in the Netherlands warily agreed. When we resolved to broaden our research, our lab was suddenly visited by members of the United States military. They were Air Force personnel, and to our surprise, they had jurisdiction over our lab. These were not kind people. They were quiet, grumpy, and brash. They asked for our research, and when we didn't immediately hand it over, they ransacked our facility. They found everything they were looking for. They even purged the genetic material we still had on hand. They explained that the samples might have been carrying a contagious disease. We hadn't seen a disease. We were all feeling fine, except for the agonizing loss of our time and research. One of us was arrested when we tried to stop them from leaving uncontested. I never saw that guy again. I didn't hear from the Dutch researchers either. We were all wondering if they had escaped unscathed. We hoped that their government would be more tactful than our own. We later learned that the study had too much military funding from our country to ever be considered neutral. The Netherlands were shut down too. Our research remains unpublished and of course unverified by any secondary teams. There was no way for us to continue our efforts without the samples we lost. The theory hasn't left my mind though. It is possible that some of us descend from an extraterrestrial parent, isn't it? Even if that parent wasn't reproducing with human beings in a naturally occurring way. Perhaps the blue-eyed members of society are the results of some alien experiment. That isn't what frightens me, however. Even if that is true, it doesn't change anything about our day-to-day -day life. My fears are tied to those samples, the ones that we lost. Dozens of candidates came in and out of our lab while we searched for the common blue-eyed denominator. Could every single specimen have been an extraterrestrial in origin? Does the very existence of that genetic material confirm that some degree of alien life was present on this planet thousands of years ago? And if all of these samples were freshly harvested before they were sent to us, where are the bodies of our alien ancestors being kept?